Thank you, Abby. So when I set out to write this book, uh, kind of my underlying question was uh, uh, why do political panics happen? And I have to tell you that what I ended up finding is not what I, quite what I expected to find. I began by looking at elements such as, so do we get them at times of political hardship? Uh, or is it off, more often is it uh, influential voices, politicians or people in the media of one type or another, uh, planting fears? Uh, or conversely, is it grassroots conflicts, economic conflicts that bubble up and, and become widespread panics? Uh, uh, also, at the, at the outset, I was looking to see if there was a, a clear distinction between alarm and panic, uh, because not all political alarm is, is necessarily panic. What was in my head at that point were things like, you know, after 9-11, uh, we had good reason to be concerned about p terrorism in the United States. Uh, in 1949, when the Soviet Union detonated an atomic bomb, uh, you know, my parents' generation had uh, good reason to be concerned, if not alarmed, that we were no longer the only nation on our Earth with this extremely powerful weapon. On the other hand, in 1834, when a mob burned down the Ursuline convent in Somerville, Massachusetts, that was panic. So how did we get, for instance, to that point in 1834? And, and uh, as an example of kind of the things that go on in the book, I want to spend a few minutes looking at that event, the burning of that convent. Uh, and the, one of the first things I didn't expect to bump into, I bumped into with that event, which is rather than national hardship contributing to it, National success contributed to it. In fact, three national successes, if you will, contributed to it. Now, the first of them was we won the revolution. And once we won the revolution, suddenly there was concern that this freedom of religion that we established in this country, not the first country to do so, but that we established in this country, England had it as well, created a fear of Catholics. If enough Catholics start coming in, the Pope may end up running the country via, you know, controlling the the votes of, of, of these uh, Catholics. Uh, five of the first 13 states had in their state constitutions uh, uh, a stipulation that only a Protestant could be elected to, to state office. Uh, and indeed, Catholics did start coming into this country. And I'm talking before the failure of the potato crop in Ireland in the 1840s. Uh, almost right off the bat, Catholics started coming in because of uh, turmoil in France surrounding the French Revolution. And Catholics from Ireland started coming in because of turmoil, political turmoil in Ireland uh, with conflicts uh, with England. Uh, uh, and as that was happening, two more national successes kick in. The first is in 1850, 1803, the Louisiana Purchase. We suddenly have all this new land. And in 1825, we complete the Erie Canal, which connects the original, if you will, body of land in this country to all this new land. And there's a and, and this is where people are moving. And a lot of these newcomers are, who are Catholic are moving there, along with others. And there's this fear that, oh my gosh, we may lose all this. All this that we've gained, we may lose. So we come to 1834. And here is a ca case of, indeed, an influential voice inflaming the, these, these fears, though he is not the only influential voice to be doing it, but is a man named Lyman Beecher. He was a very prominent minister in Boston, highly respected, father of Harriet Beecher Stowe, and uh, if any of you have heard of the abolitionist Henry Ward Beecher, was also uh, was, was his child. And he gave a sermon. The beginning of the sermon said, first line, was that the Catholic system is averse to liberty. So that is the point of his sermon. And he says, uh, under uh, the influence of their priesthood, they may be induced to act as one. So here's one of the recurring elements I start finding a lot of across the board in panic, is the use of absolutes. And the absolute here is that all Catholics think and act alike. He then goes on in the sermon, and he uses what I call a blank to be filled in, something else. You'll hear me talk about it a lot in the next 20 minutes or so uh, as a recurring element. He says... How many presses might they influence by their promised patronage? How many mechanics, merchants, lawyers, physicians, in any political crisis might they reach and render timid? I don't know how many. He doesn't tell us how many. That's for us to fill in. And there's no way we can do that without our personal fears and needs participating in the way we fill that, fill that in. 
He then goes on to actually hearken to national success. He says, it is the light of our Republican prosperity that is sending earthquakes under the, fa the foundation of their thrones, meaning the popes, I guess, and they have absolute no hope of rest but by the absolute extinction of our light. A little further in this sermon, it's a fascinating sermon from the point of view of this book anyway, he brings up something that is one the only element of this whole topic that is particularly American because I believe that this kind of panic is a human behavior. Uh, I don't think it's a, a conservative behavior, a liberal behavior, American behavior. It's a human behavior. But there's one piece that is particularly American, though it probably has comparable elements in other countries, other cultures. Uh, and he writes, if this nation is, in the providence of God, destined to lead the way in the moral and political emancipation of the world, and let me cut in right there. <laughs> there is a, uh, a, a scholar, current scholar, who's Canadian. He has a very Canadian name. His name is Sakvan Berkovich. <laughs> and he wrote a book entitled uh, The Puritan Origins of the American Self. And in this book, he argues that when the Puritans founded the Massachusetts Bay Colony, en route, they came with a mission. And it was, it was articulated en route by John Winthrop, their leader, in a sermon in which he said that in this new land, we were going to create a new Jerusalem, a city on a hill. It's going from New Testament with that phrase. And it will be a beacon to the world of a pure Christianity. And through this beacon, we will bring that light to the world. Uh, 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 what Berkovich argues is that by the time the revolution took place, the people in America had secularized Winthrop's mission and replace Christianity with liberty and freedom so that we would be a beacon to the world of liberty and freedom, democracy, and through that we would, we would bring the light of the one true way to the world. Now when I read that years ago, not that many years ago, but some years ago, my first thought was, wow, that's a really good point. My second thought, and in many ways the more important was, this little voice inside the middle of my brain that said, but we are the one true way. <laughs> I couldn't shake that, even with Berkovich pointing it out. To this day, I can't, I can't shake that. And I mention that because, at least for me, but I don't think I'm alone, that's how potent that perception of myself as an American is. And Lyman Beecher, when he made this statement in the sermon, went on to say, uh, 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 if in the providence of God we're destined to lead the way in the moral and political emancipation of the world, it is high time she understood her calling and were harnessed to the work. The work is a blank to be filled in. What constitutes the work? Within two days, I believe, if my memory is correct, of this sermon, a mob burned down the Ursuline Academy across the Charles River in Somerville, Massachusetts. Uh, this notion of influential voices such as Lyman Beecher is, of course, not an old one. Let's compare him to someone from the present. Beecher began that sermon by saying, the Catholic system uh, is averse to liberty. In 2011, Newt Gingrich said, I believe Sharia law is a, here comes an absolute, mortal threat to the survival of freedom in the United States. So, we have the same absolute, very, very parallel statement. One is concerned about canon law, and the other is concerned about Sharia law becoming the rule in this country. And in fact, both of them are doing yet another element that recurs a lot, and that's what I call the filtered fact. Newt Gingrich is a highly educated man, and I don't for a minute think he's a stupid man. And I think he probably was aware that he was filtering this fact, which, by the way, is another piece here. We, Sometimes people are panicked, and sometimes people are availing themselves of panic. And there's really no way to know for sure which is which, because you'd have to climb inside their head, and we can't do that. But I suspect that Newt Gingrich knew he was filtering the following fact. Article 6, Section 2 of the Constitution. It's called the Supremacy Clause. And it says very clearly that this, the laws of the United States are supreme over any foreign law, that no judge, and it says no judge, can rule and give privilege to a foreign law over the laws of the United States. So, in fact, Sharia law can 